Okay, and welcome to another episode of the Just Kicking It podcast. I am joined once again by Dr. Kapil Gupta, and I am really looking forward to today's conversation. Today, we're going to be discussing mostly the coach and the athlete and that relationship, as well as the individual roles. So first, Dr. Gupta, thank you again for joining me. Thank you, Joe. So to open up the conversation, I, I wanted to see, have you put any thought to the way that coaches view their athletes? I know you've previously discussed how parents maybe view their children and I think most people listening will will be familiar with parents that try to live through their child or they're over controlling and try to dictate everything they do. And they don't really allow them to to be their own person. And sometimes I feel coaches do that with their athletes as well is they are either living through them or trying to use them for their own glorification. So how do you view that relationship and what the intentions of the coach actually are? I think we have to look at it very innocently uh, and from the standpoint of truth. The only precedent that one has is the way that they were raised and the things that they were exposed to. That's really all that we have to go by as human beings. And so relating it specifically to coaches, um, very few to nobody uh, really grows up in an atmosphere of truth. They grow up in an atmosphere of culture. So it, it would be very easy and disingenuous and um, uh, to impose uh, blame in an unfair fashion to to say that you know coaches do things for themselves and they they live through the athlete and they're too controlling. First of all, they are all those things, but that isn't the point. The point is uh, to begin with. The point is that. We are a product of our environment. And a coach who has grown up in the coaching world and the traditional sports culture, by definition, virtually has to be that way. What other thing does does he have except for what he was exposed to? So having said that, um, a coach has been taught, and by virtue of his exposure and experience, uh, looks at his athletes as someone to as as individuals to instruct they don't know this therefore they must be taught this uh this technique isn't right therefore they must be taught technique now when you mention that on the face of it it sounds very reasonable to do so uh however this type of approach, although very few people are going to listen to what I just said and find anything that is problematic with it. Uh, but the problem with that, with that approach is that it produces mediocrity. This is why in high-level athletics today, uh, you essentially see uh, a very robotic uh, sort of athlete that is coming out these days. The 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 individuality, the artistry, uh, the self-taught nature of many of the older athletes across various professional sports is almost virtually disappeared in 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 modern uh, sports, and that is because of the role of coaching. Coaches are taught to coach, and they coach talent out far more than they coach talent in. They, any coach who tries to coach will, by definition, overcoach. What needs to be understood is how learning actually happens, how an individual becomes world-class, what is it that allows someone to perform at the highest level without focusing on performance? These are all very, very soft and 
uh, otherworldly sort of elements that are never, ever discussed. They simply are not a part of the Western culture. And in these days, they really aren't even a part of the Eastern culture. But you'd have to go back hundreds uh, and maybe even thousands of years to discover what the truth really is about how to truly coach a human being. Uh, so that's my answer to it. Is it's it's to it's to provide somewhat of a blow to coaching. However, to soften it, and I don't usually soften things, but where it's necessary, it's necessary. And I must soften it here by saying, yes, the coaches do do this, and it's it is completely uh, counterproductive. But that is all that they know. So it, it seems like a fundamental question that would follow is, what is coaching then? How would, how would you define, you know, for everyone listening here, how would you define our actual, our duty or our profession for many? Or, you know, what is coaching? It depends what you are trying to help uh, cultivate. If, for instance, a coach is trying to help cultivate uh, the talent of a world-class athlete to make him truly world-class, then he will first and foremost walk and tread with fear. Fear is necessary. And the reason that it is necessary is because the coach who fears that he will usurp and stifle and smother the talent of the individual standing before him, that coach will always be on guard. That's wisdom. The coach who does not fear that will go forward, full steam ahead, and invariably, invariably do harm. So, first and foremost, as, as in medicine, the first to no harm. First and foremost, what must be understood are the stakes. The most dangerous element of coaching is that you will kill or cripple the talent of the human being. You may not even know what that talent is, and the person himself the athlete himself may not even know what that talent is. That is why it is a cultivation. That is why it is a discovery and an exploration to discover what this person is already partially world-class at, and then you can chisel away at removing the excess in order to allow that world-classness to truly develop and bloom. That is the approach that must be taken if one wishes to produce a world-class athlete. Now, I'll tell you this. No one really knows how good people can be because we live in an environment of competition. Now, even that is going to be taken as sacrilege. So we're going to kill a lot of sacred cows as usual, okay? Competition produces mediocrity. When someone competes, they will only compete to the point at which they win. And when they win, they will stop competing because the competition has proven to be successful. And that's it. Competition isn't about discovering what the true level of ability that a human being can achieve is. Competition is a, a very uninspiring and menial uh, pursuit in order to, by inches, better another. This is what you see classically with Hussein Bolt uh, stopping before he comes to the finish line. Because he's already won. So this really isn't about discovering how good a human being can be because he competes. So these questions aren't really being asked. Take the, take the, take the matter of pressure, for instance. So what the question that professional sports is asking, college sports, everything, the, the question that they're asking is, how well can you perform under pressure? That is really, that is really low level to me. It really, it really, I almost, I almost 
Well, a sleep of boredom by hearing that. Because what, what you, when you say how well can you perform under pressure, what you are asking is, if you have 10 bags of sand on your back, I want to know how well you can perform with those 10 bags of sand on your back. I don't care. I want to know how well, how high you can go when you have no sandbags on your back. So I don't want to, I don't get, look at pressure as a given. To me, pressure is a disease. So all of the athletics, the athletic environments, they have it all wrong. You look at completely backwards, just like life and the life coaches and the, you know, and the spiritual gurus and the mindfulness experts and all this nonsense. It's all the same stuff. Everyone's got it wrong. They're asking the wrong questions. Now, a much more inspiring question is, how high can a human being go? What is the ultimate limit or limitlessness of a human being? In order to discover that, they would have to first remove pressure and allow the athlete to become totally free. That's the question that I'm interested in. Because if an athlete is totally free, what can he produce then? Not what can he mm-hmm. produce with sandbag on his back. Well, and Kapil, I'm actually reminded of a, a story that I, I read recently that there was basically a professor that he just stopped giving out grades. And what he noticed is that the students that came up to him and demanded that he bring the grades back weren't actually the A and B students, but it was the D and F students. And that's because the grades let them know that they're getting by. So for them, they, they're going to do the bare minimum to just get by in the class. And without the grades, they don't have that, that comfort. And when the grades were taken away, they actually engaged with the class and started to produce papers and essays that were better than even the A students. So it's sort of paralleled by what you were just talking about there, where the competition is almost allowing some athletes to pull their foot off the pedal, so to speak. Because if you're Usain Bolt and you're so much better than everybody else, you don't have to try to innovate or be too creative. You, you can, and, and it's antithesis to trying to become the absolute best that, that you can be. And it also implies that if we didn't have these, these competitions, you know, it, it might be some of the, the DNF athletes, so to speak, that all of a sudden surprise us. So sure. no, I actually, I taught a, a course when you mentioned that um, as an adjunct professor in, in Connecticut years ago. And I remember the first day I said, everyone in this class will have an A or a B by the end of the, by the end of the semester. Yeah. Put away, put away your pens and pads and just listen and let's just, let's just learn. Let's get that, the great nonsense out of the way. Yeah. Well, and so one question that I wanted to ask was when you look at the coach athlete relationship, the coaches feel like they aren't coaching unless they are just teaching. So, so a lot of coaches will say, okay, we're not coaches, we're teachers. But what they do is they just take all of the knowledge that they have and they try to force it and, and into the player's brain and they try to teach them most of the time the how. This is how you do this action. This is how you run this way. This is how you lift this weight. And when I think about your view on prescriptions, that just feels like the total opposite of what we want to do. And you already alluded to the idea of basically creating an environment for the player to, to grow himself or herself. Is that a mistake the coaches are making by always administering the how, I mean, I, I, especially in in soccer, you'll see a, a training session plan and it's a couple pages long and the coaches have on their training objectives that they're trying to impart on the players. And sometimes that just seems like ass backwards for, for lack of a better term. 
Sure, and as I said, it's because that's that's all they've been exposed to. If they're not going to teach the how, what are they going to teach? That's all that they know. It's all this world is all about is how. Without how, the world crumbles. No one, no one would have anything to say. If it wasn't for the how. Um, so, so, but it's it's this you know as this talk, you know, like all of my sort of podcasts and interviews are are meant for a very small number of people. It's for the individual who is beyond outrage, who truly wants to learn what the truth really is and look at things from a different perspective that is completely, uh, completely opposite, uh, to what society teaches. Um, so it's, to me, it's much more about having the student surprise the coach than it is for the coach to teach the, the student. Uh, the, 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 what I am constantly interested in with a new athlete or client, what I am constantly, what I'm most interested in is saying, what is it that you have that I haven't seen before? And if I dump a bunch of teaching and instruction upon you, I might bury it. So there is likely, it is likely that most people, if not all, have something very, very unique that they themselves don't even know. I want to know what that is. So my job isn't to instruct. My job, if anything, is to unteach, help them unlearn all the silliness that they've learned. And whatever the norms, and whatever the, the status quo of the way in which their culture practices and goes about things, to go completely the opposite way. Well, Kapil, one of your... One of your blogs, you have a line that says, the common coach brings a lesson plan. The great coach brings nothing. And I actually had a former guest that I know is a fan of your your blogs and your work. And he compared it to a movie. He said, if you if you have a lesson plan before a training session, he said, it's like trying to predict what's going to happen in a movie before you watch it. And mm-hmm. so I wanted to see if you could expand on that, that thought that, that the great coach brings nothing. What does that imply? What, what is he then bringing and what does that say about maybe his attention or uh, his intention during the actual training session? Shall we just, shall we talk about this via a, a, a real story that actually happened? Sure. Um, I was asked to go see a, a swimmer and I can swim. Aside from that, I know nothing about competitive swimming. <laughs> and so I went to go talk to this young man, and, uh, and I asked him, what is the point, what, what is the goal of your swimming competitions, swim meets? And he said, well, time. I said, okay, so you need to swim the fastest, right? He said, yes, fine. Okay. We went to the swimming pool. And within, uh, I don't know, an hour, the seconds began to come off. And we must have just spent a couple of hours uh, each day. And he told me, well, I've never swam this fast in my life, and I don't know what what you're doing. Well, obviously, I didn't do anything we just got him out of his mind and the swimming began to fall. So I couldn't have possibly bought a lesson plan because I don't know anything about swimming. And I must've asked him 15 times what the distance was from one side of the wall to the other. Okay. And then he begins winning swim meets. Then I'm asked to go out and see him again a year later. And the same thing happens. And we even got cut short because this is a classic culture the university that we were at, the uh, one of the coaches came out and said, "Well, if you're not a 
accredited coach here, you can't teach me. <laughs> so, so we had to cut that short. But even before we cut it short, I think I don't know how many seconds he shaved off. But he said, listen, this is crazy. I'm not shaved and prepped, whatever that means. I've had a very long practice session this morning. And despite all of that, I have never swam this fast before. Listen, okay. And that weekend, he went and had swim meet and he won. And then I got a, uh, a message a few months later that he had made the Olympic team and went to, was it Rio? So that's a classic story of uh, me knowing nothing. If you were going to create a, a scenario which would prove my point, that is what you would create. You would create a sport that I know nothing about give me a very limited amount of time and say, go produce something. That's what happened. And I had no idea what I did. I had no, I had no plan, no agenda. I didn't even know what the point of the swimming meet was. So it just comes up in the moment. It, it just arrives. And I don't know where it arrives from, and I don't really care. All I know is when, when there's a communion between two human beings and you leave the space of the mind, uh, one becomes privy and becomes invested by great powers that come from somewhere within him um, that I don't really understand, uh, but they just do. And things just begin to happen. Those things can never happen by some silly agenda or, or uh, objectives or philosophies or those things are the degree to which society, coaching, life coaching, spirituality, professional sport, the degree to which they are off the mark is literally criminal. They're not even the same zip code. The way that things are done are, are so silly that Athletes are being, in many ways, destroyed. You will never know the extent of that destruction unless you had one athlete have two lives, and in one life he did it the traditional way, and in the, in the other life he did it my way. Besides that, you, you wouldn't really know the level of which uh, athletes are being destroyed. You, you tell me why is it that less than 1% of professional athletes, less than 1% of athletes become pros. And, and what do you hear about that? What do you always hear? Well, it's very difficult, a lot of competition. So they already have, have a story for everything, right? Everyone's got a story for everything. Everyone's got an excuse as to why things are the way they are. Everyone is dying to justify the status quo. Well, it's almost no one asks, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's an enormous amount of talent. How is it the people who are this good and yet only 1% make it? Something doesn't add up. All we have are, are, are people crying outrage and, and people saying this is just the way it is and you don't, you don't get how hard it is and, and what's your backup plan and all this nonsense. This, just, just, look, just look at the evidence. Do you not think that there's something majorly wrong if that is the case? That means that there's, if less than 1% are making it, you know what that means to me? That there's greater than 99% failure rate among coaches all over the world. Uh, and to piggyback off that point, you, there's another sentence that you had in one of your blogs where you said, there are so many things that professional athletes spend their lives practicing that have nothing to do with making them great. Can Absolutely. You, can you pull that apart for us? <laughs> I, well, professional athletes follow herd mentalities. The same with their coaches who coach the professional athletes follow herd mentalities. What else are you going to do if that's all you've been exposed to? So if you're a golfer and your fellow professional athletes go to the range before the tournament and after the tournament and hit a thousand balls a day, then you're going to as well. 
Um, if they think that a, uh, a fate happens by having an open stance, then you will as well. If, if they believe that the weight room is that important, then you will as well. If, well, well, if that's the case, if that's the case, then how, how is it that Lee Trevino and Jack Nicholas and Byron Nelson, who, uh, what, from my understanding, didn't really have that much attention to diet or training or, you know, or weight room regimens or, or sports psychology. They had nothing. They didn't even have cameras, camera video to, you know, to shoot their, their swing. Um, and yet, I would argue that they were better golfers than we have today. So th- those people were supreme ball strikers. They were, they were they're Hall of Fame legends. And they ate fried chicken. So, you know, I think everything is such a farce. Everything is, everything is so cookie cutter. Uh, everything is based upon these ideas that come from nowhere. They're, they're, they're just, they're just regurgitated ideas that are based upon just someone's whim. Um, no one examines the truth. So every athlete, I, I put a Twitter message up some time ago in which I say that great, greater than 90% of professional athletes completely waste their time. You, it, is, it, it, really, it really is uh, a conspiracy uh, without trying to be one. What, what, I, had a, I had a professional athlete, who was a PGA Tour golfer, and he told me, he said, you know, when I was, when I was number three in the world, I felt like I needed a hobby. We were on the right track. <laughs> it was correct. Uh, once you learn the manner in which to do something, you don't need to practice it. I think even, even practice is a farce. I believe in training to become, not practicing to maintain. Practice itself is very much a myth. What, do you practice opening doors? Do you practice brushing your teeth? Do you practice putting on your pants? I know that you put on your pants. It takes five seconds a day, but you don't practice your, your soccer game or your golf game five seconds a day. You practice eight hours a day. What for? What are you doing? You don't know how to swing? You don't know how to kick? What, what, are, they, what are these all these formations for? From, from what I understand, when you play, when two teams play each other, no, neither team knows what the other team is going to do. So how can you practice in a vacuum with formations? I mean, how, how deep do you want to go? I mean, how many, how many stadiums do you want to burn down tonight? <laughs> I mean, at what level? What level of depth of truth do you want to go? It's all a scam. Well, Kapil, can I throw something at you that I think I want to get your thoughts on? So a few weeks ago, I was in the office with another assistant coach of mine, and I was trying to, we we were trying to understand why it was that both him and I hadn't played soccer consistently for, I don't know, five years, six years, because we're coaches now. and. Right. When, when we hopped back into training with the, with the players, we were not only the best players out there, but we both felt like we were better than we ever were in our quote unquote primes. With no practice. With zero practice. And no. my, my interpretation of that was first, it, it speaks to your point that you just said, where when I was a player, I would practice hours and hours with, with the same, you know, repetitive drills and different things in order to maintain what I already had. And then I go five, six years without touching a ball and I'm, I'm better than ever. So that's a testament to that. But then the second interesting part was I would argue that that part of the reason why I also was better was because I didn't have the same consequences that I felt when I was a player. Con- mm-hmm. Can you maybe, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And maybe do you have any uh, thoughts as well on, 
on that whole situation? Is this something you've seen before? And can you explain it a little bit better? Well, the less free you are, the more consequences you have. Right. right. So, uh, you no, know, pra- you know why, you know why hard work and practice and, uh, bleed till you drop and all that stuff. You know why that exists? Because of anxiety. Now, because, because for a team, for a coach to say, we're not going to practice. That the the person who's over that coach would fire him on the spot, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right? He'd say, "Well, you you're completely derelict in your duties." <laughs> so so practice is done not because it means something or it does anything. It doesn't do anything. Okay, practice is done because if you don't practice, something inside you, the mind, says, "Well, you're really losing out because." They're practicing over there, and all your competitors, they're practicing hard. And uh, if you're not practicing, then you're getting worse. Okay? That's why it's done. Practice and hard work are a form of anxiety. Now, rather than practice, I would say learn. What are the things that you don't understand? What are the patterns that happen in all your games that you've never really explored? And can it go back to your same nonsensical, idiotic drills, which have no foundation in anything besides just just uh, flailing of the limbs? That's all it is. It's just calisthenics. That's all it is. It's just it's just running around. Just go to the track and run around over there. You don't need to feign it. You don't need to fake it by like you're doing like real something real. You're not. Okay. So examine for yourself. Sit back. An example. What is that we're really doing? Where do we want to go? Do you want to be the hardest working team? What for? You don't get in for hard work. No one, no one cares if you worked hard. You know, that's why I think the Olympics is in many ways a scam. Because why, you know, why does everyone compete for a gold medal? That doesn't make any sense to me. You know what the Olympics should be? The Olympics should be. What is the ultimate height of a human being? Instead, it's a, it's, it's a menial competition based upon the shading of a couple of milliseconds over a 100-meter run. Who cares? It's so that a country can say, we have 19 gold medals and you have 14. It's high school. That, that, isn't, that isn't inspiring. You know, the ceremony is far more inspiring than the Olympics. So it's all just, it's all nationalistic egos. That's all it is. There, there's nothing inspiring about the Olympics to me. The Olympics is, it doesn't matter what country you're from. How I want to see that you're a human being before you're an American, or before you're an Italian, before you're a German, you're a human being first. And I want to see, I want to know, not just me talking, people who are truly genuinely serious, who call themselves serious coaches, should want to know. I want to know what are the outer reaches of capability of a human being. That's inspiring. Not how many gold medals this country has versus the other. One thing, there's a lot of questions I have based on that, but one thing that did come up there that I want to, I think would be important to maybe have you answer now is, you know, what, what is the difference between a serious coach? And I guess in, for that, based on what you just said, a serious human being, I guess, and then an unserious one, what would be the difference? The serious one wants to know what the truth really is. The serious one isn't tied to his own beliefs. The serious one isn't tied to agendas and following the status quo and trying to perform the status quo better than the other coaches. The serious one wants to walk his own walk. He wants to discover what is it within the human beings that he has under his auspices that could be unleashed and that might be stifled 
by coaching and instruction. Those are some characteristics of the serious coach. And he's willing to get fired over it. He doesn't care. (laughs) But if all you're going to be doing is satisfying your GM, then you're just a regular, common, everyday Joe. No one should pay attention to you. You have nothing to offer. Are you rare or are you just a common garden variety coach? Well, it's, it's, it's awesome that you just said that because th- this is something that I've been talking about the last <clears throat> few weeks with, with some other coaches is it's becoming clear to me the, the longer that I'm in coaching that so many coaches, when you really drill down into why they are there, it's, it's perpetually to just keep their job. Yes. <laughs> so their every waking moment is the only real objective is to just maintain exactly what they have. So it it, it seems useless. I mean, it seems sometimes, I mean, what is the point? It it does bring that sort of nihilistic question of, so we're doing all of this so that we can just keep doing all of this. That's right. That's (laughs) right. And That's that's why jobs are so toxic. Right. And you had an, you had another podcast where I, I had to listen back to it a few times, but you, you mentioned, uh, and you just triggered me again when you said, uh, you know, a sincere coach would, would rather, or a serious coach, sorry, would rather be fired. And yes. it, it, you said it on the, the previous podcast that you said, uh, it's better to be in the streets. And when you, no question. When, when no question. Said, yeah. So maybe hey, expand hey, on that. Listen, listen. If, you, if, you're, if you're in the street, right, and you're eating food out of a dump, dumpster, fine. At least you have self-integrity. At least, at least inside of yourself, you have self-satisfaction that you are completely given to your domain and to your profession. And believe me, by the way, if that's who you are, you're not going to be eating out of dumpsters for long. Right. You will be discovered. And when you are, you will become one of the sought after. But you'll have to eat crow for a while. But those, and there are people like that. There really are. There really are genuine, serious human beings in every domain in this world. They do exist. They're just very small in number. Yeah. But they do exist. And for them, their personal integrity as human beings is at stake. And I have given myself to this profession. It is my life. Therefore, I cannot allow myself to settle for the derivative nonsense that is second best. I can allow myself to settle for the derivative nonsense and things I don't care about. But the thing that I care about the most, that thing is to me is sacred. And I have no time for silliness and lanyards and conferences and, and satisfying my GM. I don't care about that. I am here and, and I'm gladly get fired on game day. If that's what that, if, if, if I'm asked to sacrifice that, those are the people who actually transform their sport. Yeah. Well, one thing to, to sort of transition us a little bit, but it's sort of sticking with the same idea is does a coach. So let, let's, let's say that that, you know, top 0.001% of, coaches that, that are serious when they're working with athletes is it important for them to also find out how serious their athletes are before they begin working with them yeah that's a very very good point um i think everyone has been taught to be mediocre for so long that it's just almost impossible to find someone who's sincere uh, the, you mentioned a discourse I wrote some years ago. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what the title was, but something along the lines of, you know, the, the coaching is a, one of the most excruciating jobs. I don't remember what the title, but something it's along a, those yeah, lines. It's a, this one says the greatest coaches live a life of torment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it. Okay. And, and I'm not sure if that's the one I wrote this in, but this idea is absolutely true. And that is that, the rarest thing for any serious teacher to find is a serious student. 
He genuinely searches for his entire life to find that one. So it is, it is absolutely a given that the serious coach will be surrounded by unserious players. He may discover a hint of seriousness in one of them, and he may take that one aside and try to develop and to coax and to uh, cultivate and allow that seriousness within that individual to bloom and keep them away from the others, keep them away from being bastardized and poisoned by the culture. That is something that, that can be done, but you're absolutely right. The coach, by definition, just he has to be. He will be surrounded by uh, staff, other coaches, uh, personnel, and players who are fundamentally unserious. He will live, he will, his life will be a life lived alone. Yeah, and you actually painted, and it is that one that you, you brought it up in, and you also painted an image that I loved, which was you said the serious coach is the one that basically sits in his home or in his office with, with the door cracked open and the light on, just waiting for that one day where, where he kind of he, he gets the knock on the door and it is that that great student or that that serious athlete. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yes, sir. And I love that image. So, well, Kapil, I think this is uh, a lot for to digest for the coaches listening. And I think it's a good note to to finish out on. And I, I think it's a conversation that hopefully we can continue. Uh, but I wanted to thank you, obviously, for your time and for sharing the, your insights and the truth. And I hope that we.